continue uh, for today's topics of supervised probabilistic classification. Uh, now we're going to talk about logistic regression. So uh, recall that we're trying to do statistical classification where we have some input uh, data and we want to get a probability of what is the uh, probability of, of uh, each of our possible answers. Uh, and so you can use classification for uh, deciding whether to stick an ad next to a search result uh, or to detect whether an email is spam or not. Uh, these are just text applications, but you can also use classification in, in, in other settings, so like determining whether a photo has a bird in it or not. And uh, this is a very common building block of machine learning methods, and that's why we're talking about it at the very beginning. We'll be using this classification machinery over and over again. So logistic regression uh, has a, a fairly simple uh, definition. Uh, we're going to have some weight vector uh, and some observations. And uh, what we do to determine the probability of that data being associated with one class or the other, so we'll just focus on binary uh, classification here, um, is based on this formula. And so uh, we have a vector of our regression weights uh, multiplied by our data vector. So that produces some number, and we feed it into this function to determine uh, whether uh, the probability of it being in the zero class or the one class is higher. And by convention today, we'll just assume that one class is zero, uh, one class is one. Okay, so let's, let's think about this a little bit more. So uh, what if all of your betas are zero? What is the probability of each of your y's? In that case, the probability of the y's would be just one, wait, one over one plus xp to the zero. So one half, one half. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if all of your betas are, uh, are zero, then this goes to zero. Uh, and x of zero is one. So that's one over one plus one, so one half. And this also becomes one half because you have x plus zero over one plus x plus zero, so one over one plus one. Uh, so both of these are one half. So if your betas are zero, you don't know anything. You just assume that, that they're equally likely. So this is like a uniform prior in a way. Yeah. So to a uniform prior. Exactly, yeah. So, so uh, without any information, you just assume equally likely, uh, which, which is the only symmetrical thing that you can do. Um, so for a shorthand, uh, we're going to, uh, so we can avoid writing one over one plus yada yada, we'll often use uh, the logistic function by itself uh, symbolized by sigma. So, um, uh, so that's, that's the definition of sigma down there. So what the heck is this sigma logistic thing that uh, appears in the name of logistic regression? It's this curve down here, this S-shaped curve. Um, and so this is nice uh, because as your inputs to this function get really small, you get numbers that are basically zero. And as your inputs get really big, you get outputs uh, that are basically one. Uh, and so uh, the other nice thing about this is it has a very simple derivative, uh, as you'll see in your homework. Could I ask uh, for a high-level explanation for where the function came from? Why are we using the logistic function? Uh, right. So uh, we want outputs that look like probabilities. And uh, so a probability is a number between 0 and 1. And uh, uh, because we want these probabilities, uh, we want to have uh, uh, outputs that lie in this range. And the logistic function is a convenient way uh, to make that happen. And it does so in a way uh, that's nice because uh, you don't have to constrain what your inputs are. So these can be, uh, this ranges from, from negative infinity Oop, that's a negative 8, not a negative infinity. Uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, so no matter what the input is, it gives you a, something that looks like a probability out of it. And so there are, there are many functions that you could use to do that. And so you could use hyperbolic tangent. Uh, um, you, you could dream up uh, uh, non-continuous functions um, uh, that, that look more like... Uh, 
like this, so like some sort of step function, um, and uh, in a more extreme case, you could have a function that looks like this. Um, so we, we don't use these things uh, because these are, are non-differentiable. Um, and so uh, we want something that has this property between 0 and 1, and we want it to be differentiable for reasons that will become clear uh, next week. So you use the language, it looks like a probability. Is there a reason for that? Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so last time uh, we were talking about naive Bayes and we were estimating probabilities and, and we had this p hat business. Um, so, so something similar is going on here. Uh, we have just pulled this formula for probabilities out of thin air. Uh, so there's no reason to believe that this is actually the probability uh, for a, an email being spam or not. Uh, we're just sort of postulating that uh, we get a probability from a function that looks like this. And uh, there's no uh, divine truth in, in this. And so uh, we've formulated a function. We hope that it matches our data well. Um, and that's why I'm saying looks like probabilities. Mathematically, it has all the pro properties of probabilities, but there's no reason that it actually is uh, the true probability that describes the data. But we hope it is. So in that case, then why do we care that it's a probability at all? Um, because uh, uh, probabilities are convenient mathematical language for talking about these things, and uh, we'll often want to combine say, a logistic regression with some other probabilistic mechanism, and for them to talk to each other, they need to both speak the language of probability. Okay, uh, good questions. Uh, all right. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, just to reiterate, uh, the output is always between 0 and 1. This allows us to model probabilities, and this makes it different from linear regression, which we'll talk about more later, but you've probably already seen that at least a little bit. Um, so, uh, the outputs of logistic regression always lie between 0 and 1, whereas linear regression have inputs going from negative infinity to positive infinity and outputs in the same range. Okay, so, so let's take an example where we want to do spam classification. And so, given the formula that we had before and these weight vectors, um, uh, let's, let's classify some documents as either being spam or not. Uh, so, uh, so the first question, uh, what does y equals 1 mean? Uh, that the document is spam. Exactly. And, and conversely, uh, y equals 0 uh, means ham. So spam versus ham. Okay. So uh, what if we have an empty document? So... Um, is it more likely to be spam or not? Uh, it will be classified as spam. Okay, and, and so why is that? Uh, because that would mean that all of the betas from 1 to 4 are 0. Mm -hmm. uh, or rather, the... Uh, so the, so the beta, beta 1 not, times yeah, x. Yes, yeah. it would be 0. Yeah. So we're left with beta not, which is positive, uh, which would lead us to believe that it's spam. Right, so, so in our formula, we add all of these things together, um, but if in an empty document, uh, these all go away, and so then you just have x of uh, point 0.1, and so uh, that's going to be uh, a number slightly larger than 1, and so then the positive class will have slightly more weight. Uh, so uh, this... Uh, will be larger than this. Uh, and so we have a slight preference for uh, spam emails uh, if we have empty input. And so uh, the bias term, B0, beta 0, uh, encodes uh, a priori what we believe is, is more likely uh, to be our class, spam or not. Okay, so let's take another example. Um, let's say our document contains mother in Nigeria. Is this going to be spam or not? So mother has a, neg has a weight of negative one. Nigeria has one of three. That's a net positive, so it's going to be classified as spam. Right, and, and so uh, uh, you also add in the bias there. That makes it even more positive. Uh, so again, uh, this is going to be 
considered spam uh, with much higher probability than our empty document. Okay, so uh, now let's do another example where uh, we have mother work Viagra mother as the words in our document. Okay, so mother is negative one, work is negative 0.5, that's negative 0.5, Viagra is uh, plus two, so that's positive 0.5, and then mother is, we see again, so that's negative one, which is still, so it's negative, so that means that it's going to be ham. Exactly. And, and so remember, um, uh, in our formula, we multiply the weight times the value. So in this case, uh, x2 uh, corresponding to mother is 2. Uh, so we have negative 2 in here. Uh, so uh, that cancels out with Viagra. And so we have the bias term uh, plus work, and that gives us minus 0.4. Uh, which gives us a ham decision. All right. Uh, so uh, I talked about how to compute this probability given a set of weights, um, but I, I haven't talked about how you actually discover these set of weights, and so right now this should seem like magic. Um, it absolutely is. Uh, next time, next week, uh, we'll talk about how to actually compute these weights um, in a way that maximizes the conditional likelihood. Um, but the intuition uh, that, that you should have gotten from this is that uh, if you have a high weight, that means that it's likely uh, to contribute to uh, the positive class, so spam in this case. And if you have a, a negative weight, that contributes to ham. And the bias overall tells you uh, which is more likely, spam or ham, in this case, spam. Uh, and uh, from the very end of our discussion of naive Bayes, you should see how uh, naive Bayes is a special case of logistic regression where we use uh, the joint probability to set the values of the beta. And so you should remember at the end of the naive Bayes discussion, we had this uh, form of naive Bayes where you have uh, uh, the log of the prior uh, plus the sum of the probability of the word uh, given the class over all of the words. And so this looks a lot like the input to naive base um, uh, when you look at the same formula for logistic regression. And so naive base is just a special way of setting the weights that only looks at the joint probability. Um, so one, one thing uh, to talk about is how naive Bayes and logistic regression contrast. So uh, naive Bayes is easier. Um, uh, we, we needed half a lecture for naive Bayes, and we'll use one and a half for logistic regression. When you say easier, do you mean for humans or for computers? Or yes. For both? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so for naive Bayes, you can actually write down what the, the probability of the class given a word is in terms of a, a closed form expression for logistic regression will have to do complicated things like taking gradients and things like that and it's harder to get to the answer. Um, and so logistic regression uh, to compensate for that actually works better once you get to medium sized data sets. Um, and for huge data sets it, it doesn't matter what you use, it'll basically get the same answer, data always win. Um, and there's an optimal reading that, that proves this in all the gory details. Um, but uh, uh, another advantage of logistic regression is that you can put in uh, arbitrary features, whereas naive Bayes doesn't like you overcounting things. Uh, so logistic regression is nice. You can add in things like, um, does the document contain the phrase white house uh, as, as an individual feature? And does the document contain the word white? Uh, does the document contain the word house? Um, this is sort of double counting your data because um, uh, these, these things are linked. Um, and naive Bayes doesn't perform as well when you do things like that, but logistic regression lets you double count these features uh, and do so in a way that, that doesn't mess up your uh, eventual performance. So in this case, would data still win? Um, oh, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I suspect not, because naive Bayes um, just cannot cope with this, and, and so th this can lead to 
um, if, if, especially if you have an adversary designing your arbitrary features, uh, this can really screw up naive days even if you have lots of data. Um, in, in real world cases, uh, that's an excellent question and uh, I, I would need to do some experiments to, to actually see. But uh, yeah, so, so that would be a, a good extra credit problem. And so when you say data always, when you were just referring to naive Bayes and logistic regression, right? Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and, um, so so that's, that's what it's been proved for uh, in this paper. Um, but in general, that, that's usually the case. Um, and, and so it's been mathematically proved for naive Bayes and logistic regression, but uh, for most of the classification techniques that, we, that we'll talk about, uh, it's usually the case that, that, that data win. Um, uh, and, and once you get to very large data, you only get marginal improvements by choosing a different algorithm. But sometimes those marginal improvements are really important uh, and can translate into millions of dollars. Um, okay, and, and so uh, you don't need to memorize uh, how to transform naive Bayes into logistic regression. Um, uh, just to understand that naive Bayes is a special case of logistic regression. Okay, and, and so next week we'll talk about uh, how we can actually learn uh, the weights beta for logistic regression uh, given some data and uh, how we can regularize logistic regression to encourage these betas to be small.